And the first introducer I'm going to introduce is Bob Fisk of Davis Polk. Bob Fisk defines public service. It's even in his genes. Bob is the son of a lawyer who was appointed by President Eisenhower to a high post at NATO. After graduating from Yale, he decided to go to law school because he once said, it seemed to me that law had the greatest influence on how government functioned. Bob graduated from my alma mater, the University of Michigan Law School, served on the Law Review, joined Davis Polk, and rose to partnership there. But he continued throughout his career to take time out for public service. He had a stint as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York from 1957 to 1961, and later a term as the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York from 1976 to 1980. During his tenure as the U.S. attorney, uh, according to the New York Times, he broke the mold for conventional U.S. attorneys by personally trying some of the most difficult and interesting and biggest cases in the office. Fifteen years later, when then-Attorney General Janet Reno needed someone to head the Whitewater investigation as special prosecutor, Bob was the obvious choice, and he did his usual superb job. Bob's commitment to public service has not been limited to his years of government service. While at Davis Polk, he served on many, has served on many committees and commissions, including the New York State Judicial Compensation Commission, the Judicial Commission on Drugs in the Courts, the Webster Commission for the Review of FBI Security Programs, and many others. And Bob has been awarded virtually every form of recognition that our profession has to offer. He's received the Federal Bar Council's Emory Buckner Award, the New York City Bar Association Medal and the Fordham Stein Prize, the American Lawyer Lifetime Achievement Award, the Michigan Law School Inaugural Distinguished Alumni Award, Go Blue, and he has served as an honoree at the very lunch you are now attending. It's my privilege to introduce him today, Robert Fisk. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to present this award to Kerry Dunn my partner and friend for 27 years since he came to Davis Polk after three years as an assistant district attorney under Bob Morgenthau. Over those 27 years, we've had a number of matters together. We've worked together very closely, and I have come to learn what a great lawyer Kerry is and what a great person he is to have on your side in a tough fight, of which we had several. His talents have been well recognized within Davis Polk. He was elected three times to the firm's three-member management committee and now serves as chair of our white-collar crime practice. His, his talents have also been widely recognized outside Davis Polk by numerous clients and by virtually every legal publication which ranks him right up at the top among his peers. Equally impressive and most relevant to today's proceedings are the enormous contributions he has made to pro bono clients and to the public interest. Larry referred to the Commission on Drugs and the Courts. Kerry was the general counsel, chief counsel of that commission, and he personally wrote the report which made sweeping recommend recommendations for drug treatment administered through drug courts instead of criminal prosecution for low-level lo low drug offenders, which received wide acclaim throughout New York State and became a model for many other states as well. Chief Judge Kay, who created that commission, was so impressed by Kerry's work that in 2006, she appointed him as the chair of her statewide commission on the future of New York courts. And that commission made sweeping recommendations for the consolidation of New York's nine major trial courts into two courts and also a fifth appellate, a fifth uh, department to expedite a, a appellate, a, a appellate process. He served as a director of the Legal Aid Society and the director of the Fund for Modern Courts. 
and in 2012, after serving as chair of the Judiciary Committee and later a member of the Executive Committee of the City Bar Association, Kerry was elected as president of that association. He, in, in, during the two years that he served there, he lifted that association to new heights. One of his most innovation, innovative accomplishments was the appointment of a task force on new lawyers in a changing profession. And he assembled a group of eight law school deans, managing partners from large and small law firms, <clears throat> the district attorneys of New York and Brooklyn, general counsel of Fortune uh, 100 companies, and heads of major legal, organiz legal aid organizations in the city. And they came up with a number of innovative recommendations. One was the creation of the New Young Lawyer, New Year Lawyer Task Force, New Lawyer Institute, which provides a continuing education curriculum to give young lawyers the substantive knowledge and the practical skills to help them get a head start on their career. And equally interestingly, he came up with the idea, or this commission came up with the idea of a new law firm for persons of moderate means. And it dealt with a paradox where, on the one hand, there's an oversupply of lawyers, and on the other hand, while the, the, the middle class was in need of legal services, and the concept was to have a, a law firm really staffed by young lawyers with appropriate supervision and training dealing with the problems of the, of the middle class. And I'm glad to say that although Terry Carey's term is finished at the city bar, both of those projects are going ahead full steam that he initiated. Carey's contributions to the public interest were rec rec recognized by <clears throat> the Fund for Modern Courts, which presented him with the John J. McCloy Award several years ago. So it's clear that Carey's contributions to his public interest rival those of all of his predecessors. But there's another facet to Carey's accomplishments that sets him apart. None of them, myself included, can lay legitimate claim, as Carey can, to being a rock star. Earlier this year, Davis Polk entered a rock band in a concert sponsored by an organization called Law Rocks. The mission statement of Law Rocks reads as follows, quote, the mission of Law Rocks is to benefit nonprofit organizations in cities across the country through our epic fundraising concerts which star competing bands of talented legal professionals turned rock stars. The Davis Polk Band, called the Objections, <laughs> played against a number of other bands in the Gramercy Theater with Kerry Dunn playing the drums barefoot and with four instead of the traditional two cymbals. So it's my great pleasure to be up here to be able to present the Law and Society Award to Davis Polk's professional rock star, Kerry Dunn. <laughs> the award is presented in honor of your exceptional commitment to public service. Thanks, Bob. Not only were we called the objections, but our uh, motto, which we came up with, was a, a rock band um, whose appeal can never be denied. <laughs> Ba-boom. Um, 28 years ago, uh, Bob said 27, but because there was some months that elapsed, uh, the math still works. 
Um, I had the good fortune to be sitting in Bob Fisk's office for the first time, uh, interviewing for a position at Davis Polk. And five minutes into that interview, I decided that the best thing I could possibly do uh, if I had the opportunity would be to join Davis Polk and come back and work for this guy doing anything possible that he'd asked me to do. Um, and that's exactly what I did on November 9th, 1987. Uh, looking back, that was uh, easily the best uh, career decision I ever made. Uh, but of course, I'm not alone in that. If you look around our city, I look around our country, there are many dozens of attorneys, judges, uh, law professors, uh, government officials who've had that opportunity to work with Bob and to have learned from him, and most of all, to have understood by his example the importance of public service. Um, so for that, our profession is forever in his debt, and so thank you, Bob Fisk. Um, before anything else, I want to say how uh, honored I am today to be sharing this stage uh, uh, at lunch with Don Liu, who you'll hear from in a minute, obviously, uh, with whom I've, I've worked with on a number of projects, and whose lifelong commitment is to diversity and pro bono, which you'll hear more about, is an inspiration to us all. So please, congratulations, Don. Um, I also want to thank my friends and colleagues at Davis Polk and at our clients, many of whom are here today, at, right in the front tables here, um, for giving me the platform and the support over the years to, uh, frankly, to spend time doing all those non-billable things you just heard described. So thank you to Davis Polk, too. And, and lastly, I want to thank my wife, Kate Manning, who's here today, who uh, 30 years ago last month uh, answered in the affirmative when I asked her if she would marry me. Um, I'm smart enough to know that that is the best thing that ever has or will happen to me, so thank you, Kate Manning. Now, as you've heard, as you, as you should have heard, uh, you'll, you'll hear in a minute, a nice tradition associated with this event is that the two awardees every year uh, get a chance to have a breakfast with all the staff of NILPI um, in advance of the event. And Don and I got to do that several weeks ago. Um, one of the topics I was curious about uh, was to hear from the group what they knew about the founding of the organization of, of NILPI uh, and what inspired the early leaders. Um, I asked about that because they believe that all of these organizations uh, have a story to tell about their founding. And there's a risk that if you don't tell that story, you might lose some of that original inspiration. So for example, when I was president of the city bar here, um, I was very fond of talking about the, the, that organization's founding in 1870. Back then, 200 of the city's most prominent lawyers uh, got together one night in a secret and rather perilous meeting. It was so perilous that uh, one of them was almost beaten to death on his way home after the meeting that night. The purpose of the meeting was to have all these lawyers sign a document pledging to stand up to Boss Tweed and the Tammany Hall political ring, which then really ran the city, and in particular, to refuse any further to do the bidding of the corrupt judges who really populated the city's courts. Um, in this way, they formed the first bar association in the country, and to this day, that commitment to reform really animates a lot of the city bar's uh, debates about uh, issues, including especially the integrity and independence of the judiciary. Now, NILPI has an interesting, uh, interesting and equally inspiring founding story, um, and was itself born out of the city bar. The year was 1976, and in the prior decade, um, our profession had witnessed the uh, legal upheavals of the civil rights movement, the uh, challenges to legit the legitimacy of the war in Vietnam, and uh, the Watergate scandal all of which had raised important questions about the rule of law in American society. Um, at the same time, the business of law in this city was changing back then, uh, not that it doesn't continue to change. Um, but there was then the emergence of the larger law, law firms. Um, there was more competition for younger associates who were increasingly interested in finding firms that were committed to giving back to the broader community. Um, in particular, there was increasing attention to what we're now calling the justice gap. Um, that is uh, the fact that important civil law needs of the disenfranchised were not being met by either the government or the private bar. Um, 
Remember that the 1963 case of Gideon v. Wainwright, of course, said that anyone who's charged as a criminal defendant uh, must be provided with counsel if he or she can't afford one. Um, however, the fact was in 1976, and it remains the case today, that there's no uh, civil Gideon counterpart to that, to provide counsel to an indigent litigant um, who's facing other and sometimes equally challenging uh, legal needs or challenges. Um, to pause on this for a minute, imagine that someone you know is arrested for jumping a turnstile, uh, a misdemeanor for which the likely penalty might be a, a fine that's less than a traffic ticket or uh, a day of community service or something like that. Um, that person, of course, upon arraignment, will be pro provided a lawyer free of charge if he can't afford it. On the other hand, if that same defendant perhaps because of the misdemeanor charge, is then locked up pending a deportation hearing, or if he's faced with eviction because he can't meet his rent payment, or if he's the subject of a custody proceeding where the state is threatening to take his children away, um, in any one of those proceedings, where arguably the consequences are more serious than that of the turnstile jumping, our legal system still says, uh, too bad, if you can't afford a lawyer, we'll proceed without one. Well, in any event, getting back to 1976, that was the situation that the founders of NILPI um, set out to address. It was a brilliant idea with burgeoning numbers of young lawyers uh, looking to spend some of their time providing free legal services to the poor, with law firms under pressure to provide those opportunities, but without um, any way to match these ambitions to the actual legal needs, why not create a small organization that can go into the communities, as you saw in the video, identify cases and match them with the supply of lawyers who are looking to help. So, and so NILPI and really the modern law firm pro bono movement were born. There were initially 11 attorneys and nine law firms and they persuaded Cy Vance, who was then the city bar president in 1976, to provide space and support for that new organization. As they say, the rest is history, and I'm not going to dwell on the great, great work because you've seen a bit about it already. Um, but NILPI now works with over 70 law firms and corporate law departments. I don't know if any of the founders could have imagined such, such success, but uh, in today's terms, we call that the power of leverage. So in closing, I just want to observe, without sounding corny, um, how lucky we are and how ennobled we should feel to be members of a profession that still counts among its core values a commitment to doing good. Um, yes, the law is a business, uh, and yes, it's uh, often dispiriting to read the snarky postings on above the law or so much about profits per partner and law firm salaries, et cetera, et cetera. But it remains an industry where our rules of professional conduct still contain an official exhortation that all lawyers should provide pro bono support to the poor. And whether it's 1870 or 1976 or 2015, there remains a deep recognition that given our role as gatekeepers to our legal institutions, it falls on us as lawyers to uphold the rule of law and see to it that justice is done as best possible, uh, whether there's a current civil Gideon rule or not. I don't have anything against doctors or plumbers or airline pilots, but I don't think those or any other profession has this concept as part of its DNA. Um, so I think it's appropriate once in a while to drop the cynicism and recognize how cool it is that people like the staff of NILPI dedicate their careers to this principle and that people like you all support that work in your own ways, including by writing checks and showing up and applauding the work of an organization like this and hopefully none of you needs to get beaten up for it on the way home. Um, you all should be proud for supporting not only what NILPI does, but what it stands for. I thank you for that, and I thank NILPI for giving me this award. Thank you.